I think the message we're about to hear today is, is a bit untraditional in the, in the sense of our ordinary speakers here who are usually politicians. But I do think, and I know a number of you agree with me on this, that her message has every bit, if not more, significance to the future of this state for little children like that little six-year-old, six-month-old baby in the corner uh, as any politician's message that we hear uh, regularly. I'm as excited as I can be. In this fast-paced world, I think we have to, to pause and think and, and reevaluate the significance of the family to all of our lives and all of our futures. And I think uh, today's speaker, Professor Elizabeth Fox Genovese of Emory University, has some very cogent remarks to, to uh, make in that regard. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Elizabeth Fox Genovese. Thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And I will say that although um, we don't always think of family issues and women's issues with respect to hard politics, this year that may be a serious error. Last time around in a presidential campaign, it was, you remember, it's the economy, stupid. I think this time around, it's going to be nobody's talking about my life, stupid. That, that voters are really still fluctuating between the Democrats and the Republicans trying to find something that responds to their immediate concerns. And if you don't think the Democrats are conscious of it, um, obviously it's for the feminist vote that Clinton vetoed the partial birth abortion bill, but at the same time, the Democrats, we learn, are making a tr great effort to appeal to what they think of as ordinary women, and they're puzzled to death that these nice working mothers seem not to vote Democratic. Well, I would suggest that the Republicans not take these nice working class, mo working mothers for granted while other people are courting them. Official feminism is represented by now, NARAL, the Fund for the Feminist Majority and the Ms. Foundation, has shown little interest in families and children, except in the case of single mothers and single sex marriage. Feminist blindness, feminism's blindness on this score is especially disappointing, since notwithstanding various excesses, the women's movement has made real contributions to our debates on public policy and social justice. Briefly, few women or men would today oppose equal pay for equal work, a woman's right to get credit in her own name, or zero tolerance for sexual harassment. And I mean the real thing, not the fake. <laughs> Even in the very recent past, women have typically earned much less than men, even when they have performed the same work, and they were frequently barred from desirable occupations. The last 30 years have witnessed revolutionary changes. Today, women outnumber men in college and are close to matching them in graduate and professional schools. While 30 years ago, women did earn 59 cents on the male dollar, today, women who do the same work as men start out earning the same pay. And if over time, some women come to earn less than men for the same work, it is overwhelmingly because they have chosen to take some time out along the way for a family. In other words, the issues that most concern women cannot be solved by affirmative action. It had, for women, it has done its work. The improvement in women's economic position has, however, unfolded in tandem with a host of other changes that have had serious consequences for families and children. The most dramatic include the massive entry of married women, especially mothers of young children, into the labor force, the increase in divorce, and the proliferation of single motherhood. Most of us are familiar with the numbers. As many as half of all marriages will end in divorce. 
A third of all children are born to single mothers and as many as 70% of African American children. Today, the typical working woman is a mother and the typical mother is a working woman. Feminists have not shown much interest in the working mother, unless, of course, she is a single mother. They have shown a distressing tendency to measure women's needs either by the yardstick of sexual freedom, which they defend as a woman's fundamental right, and it is on the grounds of women's sexual freedom that they defend both welfare and partial birth abortions. Or, to measure women by the standard of absolute equality with men, which they also regard as a woman's fundamental right. And if we seem to see differences between women and men, then we are going to have to change men to level the playing field. Neither of these measures, however, promise much good for women's relations with families, especially children. And they have, as Mal Maggie Gallagher argues in her new book, The Abolition of Marriage, proved disastrous for marriage. Sexual liberation and individual self-realization, aided and abetted by the transformation of our economy, have powerfully conspired to destroy marriage as it has been known throughout world history. Apparently, without ever admitting that two and two do make four, we contemplate the mounting evidence of divorce, cohabitation, single motherhood, child abuse, including sexual abuse, and violence perpetrated by children, not to mention children's suicide, alcoholism, and substance abuse. How we look at all that and say something isn't wrong with the family, I don't know. To be fair, many people register the signs, but almost everyone finds someone convenient to blame. Conservatives charge women with simply neglecting their responsibilities. Feminists charge men with brutality. Everyone deplores deadbeat dads. Some preach a restoration of family values. Other pre others preach sexual equality and joint parenting and some people look to a rejuvenation of fatherhood. All of the charges, like all of the solutions, have some merit, but they all avoid the real problem. Marriage as the essential social unit, the glue that binds men and women to one another and from infancy binds children to society, has disintegrated. The mounting evidence leaves no doubt of the magnitude of the disaster. The myth of the good divorce is precisely a myth. Short of pathological abuse and brutality, divorce is never good for children and not much better for adults. Nor can professional caretakers or the village substitute for the family, which must be something more than a collection of roles and functions. <laughs> Remarriages following a divorce solve none of the problems and frequently exacerbate them. Stepfathers rarely invest as much time and love in children as biological fathers and are much more likely to abuse them. Sexual abuse is overwhelmingly perpetrated perpetuated by stepfathers and mothers live in boyfriends. This is not natural fathers who are suddenly turning against their children. Meanwhile, divorced biological fathers rapidly lose the sense of responsibility for and everyday engagement with children with whom they do not live. Cohabitation before marriage does not improve the marriage's chances for success. It weakens them. Divorced mothers can rarely provide children with the attention, resources, and opportunities they need and to which they are entitled. And the children of mothers who have never married fare even worse than those of divorced mothers. And if you think that the moral and emotional commitment of a father doesn't matter to a child, just think that the children of widowed mothers 
do very well even when they lack economic resources because they have the sense they lost their father through a stroke of fate or an act of God, not because he walked out on them. The delusion that divorce and single motherhood do not harm children presumably originated in adults' need for comfort and reassurance for themselves. No matter how selfishly we behave, our kids will be okay. With respect to the needs of children, that wisdom amounts to nonsense. But then it is serving adults no better. Thinking to have liberated ourselves from the bondage of serious promises and their responsibilities, we have condemned ourselves to a wasteland of loneliness and despair. We are beginning to acknowledge the burdens that sole responsibility for children imposes upon women, especially if the women are poor. We have been slow to acknowledge the tremendous cost that men's freedom to leave or never enter into marriage imposes on all of us beginning with the men themselves. The men who father children outside of marriage disproportionately end in jail, addiction, or premature death. One may, without exaggeration, argue that the entire history of civilization has been a sustained attempt to bind men to women and children, literally to domesticate men's propensity for aggression and sexual irresponsibility. Within the past few decades, the project has unraveled as if by the snap of a finger. Fatherhood, good fatherhood, grounds children's well-being, and its absence painfully cripples them and all of us. For that fatherhood remains essential to the health and prosperity of any society. Whatever we may like to believe, neither mothers alone nor the village can substitute, and the personal failings of individual men are adding up to a major public crisis. It seems increasingly clear, then, that no-fault divorce has caused more harm than good. Yet even the most well-meaning feminists and liberal policymakers refuse to credit the evidence. Instead of focusing upon parents' responsibilities to children, they focus upon what both parents and children should get from society. Thus, they insist that both parents and children depend on wider nets of social ties, on communities, and predictably remind us of the popular African proverb. As it happens, many across the political spectrum would agree that the disintegration of schools or the infestation of neighborhoods by drug dealers, among other evils, does jeopardize children. But what about the collapse of two-parent families? Those who do not see the stable two-parent family as a high priority are wont to argue that if we place too much emphasis on the importance of a father, a resident father, um, we might add stigmatization to the ills that the children of divorce already suffered. We can't afford to strengthen marriage because poor Johnny or Susie will feel uncomfortable in school if we don't approve of divorce. But it is a big and disingenuous reach from the respect that every child deserves as an individual to the claim that we should not deplore the proliferation of single parent families and do everything we can to strengthen two parent families. The point is not that the strengthening of marriages alone will improve children's situation, but it seems foolhardy not to place strong marriages high on the list of what children need. The more one reads even the most thoughtful and sympathetic pro-village proposals for the improvement of children's lives, the more one suspects that their main goal is to train teachers, social workers, law enforcement officers, and community leaders to behave like and replace parents. In other words, they want all these figures to cultivate the sensitivity 
of a parent's need to the individual child. And even the most telling criticisms of bureaucratic rigidity ultimately point toward the transformation of institutions into informal networks like families. The goal of flexibility is fine, but even if it could be attained, it could not substitute for the people with whom, whom children live. Any child's first need lies in feeling himself or herself the most important thing in the world to someone. And that is a need which even the best trained, most caring, and most enlightened professionals are very unlikely to fill. Furthermore, there's reason to be cautious about what we may reasonably expect from the public sector. There are, for example, a number of innovative schools around the country, um, even schools that don't go in for self-esteem and are trying to build a real a serious curriculum, but the most generous estimate would place them somewhere near 300, and we have 83,000 public schools. And even the most generous supporters of these schools would tell you that their success depends upon the presence of one charismatic individual, and we can't count on the individuals being replaced. These are not, this does not suggest that the school will substitute for the family. It's impossible to exaggerate the importance of schools. After all, I'm an educator, and social services, and police forces. In our world, no family can reasonably count upon going it entirely alone. But those who insist upon the need for a village to raise a child invariably begin by trying to teach the agents of the village to provide what the psychiatrist, D.W. Winnicott, called just good enough mothering and fathering. If all we need is for the agents of the village to behave like good enough parents, then why do we not begin by encouraging the parents who know the child best to do that job themselves? Then when they need help, as most parents do, we can encourage the agents of the village to behave like good enough public servants. <laughs> For if we cannot do this much, we might just as well give up on our ability to provide any kind of decent future for American children. The feminists and pro-village advocates have yet to offer an adequate reply to those traditionalists who insist upon policies that give priority to the two-parent family and who certainly do not advocate the stigmatization of a child raised by a single parent. They have no answer, but we are in serious danger that they will win the battle of rhetoric, which means that there has to be a concrete response to the liberal pieties about the needs of children. Now, I'm going to briefly suggest um, a number of policy measures, some of which are currently in discussion and some of which do not enjoy the discussion in prominence that, in my judgment, they should enjoy, um, simply to give a sense of the things I think we should be looking at to strengthen families, the majority of which will include a working mother. <clears throat> Modification of no-fault divorce. That's already being discussed. I think it should be, the discussion should be extended. Tax deductions for dependent children. We've gotten stuck on Clinton's not thinking we could afford $500 deduction for a child. A really family-friendly policy would give us a 1,000 or 2,000 deduction per child. As it is, we have deductions for daycare and household help for women who go out to work full time. And I don't mean ordinary women, I mean elite career women, which many of us, by the way, are, I know that. But how in the world does any of that help the woman who is agonizing about whether she can afford a little bit of time 
off from work, at home with their child, and who cannot afford help that will replace her dedication and intelligence. So deductions. AIDS testing of mothers and babies. This hasn't begun to get the attention it deserves, but at least it reveals the cynicism of the opposition. At the moment, we cannot test mothers for AIDS. We test babies, but we don't link the test result to the name of the child. Children born, babies born with AIDS have a, up to a 50% chance of spontaneous recovery. They also respond very positively to ACT, with the result that if we knew which mothers and which babies show the virus, we could prevent almost all development of AIDS from infancy. The one thing that works against it is that if the child drinks its mother's milk, it is condemned to the full force of the disease. Now you tell me why it isn't obvious and humane simply to require tests, whether from the point of view of respect for the life of the child or concern for the resources of our society at large. Um, it interferes with the sexual freedom of women. Um, portable health insurance, which just if you saw the morning papers passed the Senate yesterday, I think it should be extended for part-time workers to allow working mothers greater flexibility and the possibility of giving more time to families. I recommend to you, I'm sure many of you know, Senator Dan Coates' proposals for American renewal notably enhanced deductions uh, for charitable contributions that would work to the strengthening of churches and communities. Um, maternity IRAs, which is something I advocated in, in my recent book, that a woman and her partner, be able, husband, be able to contribute to an IRA, and the woman could begin as soon as she starts working to be drawn upon tax-free for up to three or four years after the birth of a child. So a way of saving to take some time off. Um, maternity leave and revised daycare standards so that there can be more local, community-based women taking care of one another's children. Separately and together, these issues point toward a rethinking of a genuinely family-friendly policy for the country. But they do not point toward a rollback of basic gains for the women's movement. We cannot turn back the clock. But acceptance of justice and equity for working women does not require that we capitulate to the mindless and destructive equality implied by the recent feminist arguments in favor of strict scrutiny for gender, identical treatment. Most women must work at least part-time for much of their lives. Most women want desperately to be good mothers. If we refuse to support policies that facilitate women's contributing to a family's income at the same time that they meet their responsibilities to children, we will inescapably find ourselves contributing to the further erosion of marriage and the dispossession of children. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, attacks, whatever. Yes, sir. Look, I, I believe that one of the major courses, causes of divorce is the ease of getting divorce. That the very idea of a binding commitment, the incentive to make it work, and I'm not arguing 
for masochism. You, no one should stay with someone who beats them up physically. But the sense that um, you both sides, man and woman, that the, the goal is to work it out rather than to get what I want. Um, second, a culture, and culture does matter in all of this, and Bill Crystal is one of the first to say so. The idea that somehow the romantic love of late teens and early 20s is the norm for love and that it will continue in precisely the same form throughout life. I mean, every adult in this room knows that there are different kinds of love and that a, the deepening love of a good marriage is not precisely the same thing as the flutter of dating when you're in high school or college. You know, you, um, but I think there's an ideal of being in love. I have real doubts about some of the consequences of the sexual revolution. I think that there has been a kind of public display and even commodification of sex that suggests some kind of combination of the ultimate personal fulfillment and superb technique that one should get what one wants. That these are all things that are good for the person. It's, it's the self magazine syndrome. And in saying that these have been powerfully influential, I don't mean to suggest that people who get divorced are bad or selfish in those ways. It's, um, divorce is normally overwhelmingly painful for people. But the incentives to stay together, the culture of what human beings want out of life, has changed so beyond recognition that the compromise, giving up, that w someone might sacrifice something for someone else, all of those uh, service, commitment, binding vows, all of that has just been eroded. There wasn't any one big blow. It's as if it simply fell away. And I really think we need to recover some of it. We've moved, we've moved the mentality of Wall Street in the 80s into personal relations. Get what you can while you can and move on. You're absolutely on target, and all I would add to it is that what I said earlier about the general tone of the culture has contributed to it. I still know very successful, powerful gentlemen in politics, law, business, who wouldn't consider using impolite language in front of a woman. Um, but with the younger generation, and again, certainly on television and in the culture at large, the relaxation of what is considered manners, good taste, etc., cetera, um, has been eroded. And wim so women have stepped into it, not merely when it was a, a constant feel, right? 
but when the norms for everyone were changing so that we get a public language that presumably 20 years ago would have been reserved for locker rooms or, or bars or something. I don't know. Yes, there's been a great deal of that. And Gloria Steinem recently said, well, look, we've become the men we used to want to marry, as if that were the ultimate goal. I think the positive signs are that the vast majority of women, both from following polling data and through all the interviews that I did for my recent book, are very comfortable with being competent human beings at their work, whatever level of work they do, um, and being able to deal with all kinds of things that men deal with, and still feeling like a woman, and enjoying some manners, and enjoying valuing some measure of respect. But, but sure, there's been an idea, there's, there's been the sense that women should be able to do anything that men do, including use whatever language they please. Yes, of course you're right about that. And in general, I regard the victim line as preposterous, but also potentially dangerous. I wish I could be flip about it. But part of the emphasis on women as victims um, is used to justify a strengthening of not the village this time, but the state of laws that interfere more with people's lives, of rules for kinds of behavior that used to be entrusted to manners and to decency, um, of protection for indiscretion would be charitable in my judgment, but, but for to be protected while you court danger. And for the life of me, I do not understand why a woman's freedom depends upon the right to go out to a singles bar late at night dressed in something that resembles a nightgown without a whole lot of underwear, um, and then some hours later, wherever they happen to find themselves, just say no. Um, yes, I loathe rape. She should be able just to say no. But the idea of pushing the test case to that point on the assumption that you're a victim, so someone will step in and take it over for you, I mean, there's a certain point beyond which if an adult woman gets herself in a, an ambiguous or charged sexual situation, it's like entering the bull ring. You know, um, if you're gonna, or the boxing ring, if you're gonna fight as equals, then enjoy the danger and take responsibility for yourself. And if you don't like dangerous, in fact, I think m most women do not then a little prudence is probably in order. But the emphasis on victim is designed to disguise all of these subtleties and what women's role, own personal role is in defining their place in a social setting. And I don't want to go on too long, but you could say the same thing for education where the consequences risk being even more serious because gender equity in education that just slipped through without a whole lot of people's noticing it within um, 
the last year treats women as victims educationally, when all the statistics, by the way, show that women are doing better than men, and argues for a redesigning of curriculum for um, the ways in which boys should be treated by teachers in classrooms, and on and on and on to compensate for wi women's victim status. And the consequences for education could be real serious. Look, obviously, I, one can't, that's a, that's a very difficult one because it's very hard to control people. But we do have a culture of sexual promiscuity beginning for children. And I think the whole notion of discretion and or abstinence in sexual matters for young people, chastity, the various movements are around, are in fact very good things. I don't think adults can expect children to behave better unless the adults themselves behave better. I mean, we have to give kids a sense of what we admire. And Yes, I agree with Gertrude Himmelfarb, who's a friend and I work with, and with Gingrich. Shame is important, and it's a very delicate balance. It's, I mentioned something analogous in my talk, between stigmatizing a child and disapproving adult behavior. But I think we have to learn to draw that line. The Catholic Church always says, condemn, hate the sin, but not the sinner. There's got to be a combination of charity and respect and even love for individual people and a sense of the real needs and values of society as a whole.